you're all here tonight for our presentation. We have a special guest speaker, Dr. Kirstie Lawrence. Um, you guys know um, Kirsten Weigel. She's presented to us before on tracking, and she's going to be coming back this winter to talk about tracking. And Kirsten um, basically helped set this up and connect us with Dr. Lawrence, who's a wildlife ecologist and a university level teacher, um, spends half of the year in Africa and the other half in in the US and her PhD research focused on trackers and tracking in Southern Africa. Um, she has, uh, she's the owner of Original Wisdom, which is an experiential education company. And she develops and runs courses for students and groups in the US and in uh, Southern Africa. Uh, basically the courses emphasize um, uh, of science and emphasize all of this stuff around tracking. So I'm really excited that that uh, that we have her here tonight. And so I want to welcome her and I'm going to turn it over to, you, to, to uh, Dr. Lawrence. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to share my screen. And I just want to say that um, that was an awesome download of information about the rovers and I would completely be a member if I lived <laughs> here. I'm envious of that kind of an organization. You know, I mean, it's obvious that a lot of thought went into creating and maintaining such an organization. So fantastic. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, and yeah, so I'm going to, my talk tonight is probably not going to be linear because that's not the way my brain works. Um, I'm very random. I pull in information from everywhere. And if a thought crosses my mind, I tend to talk about it um, or at least observe it. And so you'll probably notice a little bit of that randomness, but towards the end, I'm hoping if you're still around because I might go a little bit long. But if you're still around, that those threads of my thought process will weave, start to weave together. And I'm going to be talking in little dribs and drabs throughout this about a couple of different things. So what is tracking, which I think you've had an, a couple of experiences about tracking. So probably some of you know what tracking is um, and who trackers are. And then... Um, the cyber tracker system for evaluating trackers. What is that? And then also how I use tracking as a tool in ecological education. And I'm not going to be speaking directly like this is my technique that I use so much as illustrating that throughout the presentation. Some tracks are easy to identify. Even if they don't have scale and from a photo, which are two things that are quite challenging for trackers. And even if you've never set foot on African soil. And that was one of the findings actually of my PhD is that some tracks, tracks, not signs of mammals that are big and that are common are more easy to identify than the alternative. And so people who have never seen some tracks and signs before know what they are and that it actually requires experience and skill, what we like to call dirt time, to start to get to a level where you know more complex tracks and signs. And this isn't rocket science, right? But nevertheless, it's an important finding because that has a lot of implications for scientific research and job opportunities and even for hobbies, right? So if we look at this fine sand here, we see all the cracks in the bottoms of this elephant's feet. And I'm sure you all knew that this was an elephant true, right? <laughs> okay, so elephant. But you can see all of the cracks and the fine detail in these fresh elephant tracks. 
And the front track is the rounder one on the left. And the hind track is the more oval one on the right. I hope that that's not flipping it around for you. And you can see the toe scuff mark on the right side of the screen as this animal moves through. And a little bit of drag of the heel in the front foot, right? So most mammals, that front foot is bigger because it carries the weight of the head and the neck. And if you think about it, those big squishy feet that an elephant has, it puts them down on the ground and that foot compresses and it just becomes this big pad, like it actually compresses into the soft earth and leaves this circular shape that's carrying the weight of that massive head and that trunk and those big tusks. And then the back end is just kind of coming along, right? So you see that, like you see that in the animal's body when you look at the tracks. These are those big soft feet. And you can see that front foot as it compresses, as the weight of that animal pushes it down into the ground. And look at those cracks on the bottom of that elephant's foot. Did you know that each elephant has a unique pattern in the bottom of its feet where you can identify individuals? So you can actually tell them apart from their tracks if you pay attention. And you know, sometimes you're just out there and you're having fun and you're not paying attention and that's cool. But if you want to, you can actually figure out who's who in the elephant kingdom. Even though clear elephant tracks can be easy for almost anyone with any level of, of experience to identify, following an elephant's trail and finding it can be surprisingly difficult. Big animal walks around in large groups most of the time, right? But those big soft feet don't leave any hard edges that you can see a lot of the time. If you're not in soft substrate, if you're in hard substrate or after a rain, and what do I tell people here in North America when we go trailing? Watch for when it's going to rain. Watch for when, for when it's going to warm up after snow and the snow melts off the land. Because those are the times when the ground is soft. And those are the times that you're going to get the most success when you follow an animal. In finding them, that's what your success is, right? But in South Africa, when it rains, because the layer, the base layer of the soil, the substrate that we are looking at in most places is granular sand. The water compresses all of those sand grains together more tightly than usual. And the more water you have, the more they compress together. And then you get this big animal with these big soft feet coming along, or 30 of them. And Nothing. Because one of my mentors in Africa says, did you look for the Red Bull camp? Because Red Bull gives you wings. Right? So did these animals fly away? No. And if they're not feeding, then you're not even able to follow the signs of their feeding or the signs of them dropping their dung along the way. And it can be very, very difficult. During lockdown, I was fortunate enough to be stuck at our old camp, which was inside the Kruger National Park. And it was on the banks of the Olifants River where our deal with the managers of the reserve was, you can be at your camp, but you have to do an anti-poaching patrol for us once a day along the river. Great. <laughs> I don't have to be stuck in a house and I can go for a walk along the river every day, you know? And, I, and if we find a fresh trail, we can follow it, right? Because we don't have anything else to do. <laughs> so lockdown was not as hard for me in that aspect as it was for some other people. And one morning 
my partner Lee and I, we went out with our apprentice Phil, grabbed the rifles, went out and were doing our patrol along the river and found fresh lion tracks coming up from the river. A whole pride, females, young, the three big males that were resident in the area, our resident coalition following along, must have been, I don't know, 13 lions, something like that, coming up. And I took the trail and Phil and Lee were following behind me. And they come up from the river and they go through what we call a donga, which is basically a deep valley. And I'm heading into the sun, but the sun is getting high. And usually with tracks, you wanna put the track between you and the sun so that you see the shadows more easily. But when the sun gets higher overhead and it gets high and it gets bright in Africa, when the sun gets high, you don't have those shadows anymore. And then you're moving around the trail and you're looking to see, okay, can I see that toast up there? Maybe I see the three lobes of the back of a pad of a cat over here. And I'm following this winding trail through this donga. And sometimes they're on the main route and sometimes they're not. And they're doing this because that's what lions do as they walk in a pride. You know, they're, this one catches something interesting over there in its eye and it goes over there and it looks and that one walks over here and they're cats. You know, I mean, <laughs> so, so every one of them has its own agenda, right? But they're a group of cats. So you're following, you know, this one, one of them at one time, a youngster here, a female there, a male there, but you're following the group. And uh, I'm looking ahead into all of the shadowy places underneath bushes because it's getting hot. It's getting to the middle of the day. and in the middle of the day, many of the creatures in Africa, lions are a prime example of this. They want to go someplace where it's shady and they want to sleep through the heat of the day. So I'm looking in all those shadowy places for the flick of an ear or the twitch of a tail or the turning and flopping of a body, you know, a big golden yellow body somewhere in those shadows. And I'm listening and I'm feeling the wind. You know, where is the wind? Is it coming at me? Which means that they can't smell me. And that's where it was at the moment. And we come up towards a rise where over the top of the rise, I can see a huge termite mound. There's big termite mounds there, the size of houses. And on, out of this termite mound is growing this big jackalberry tree. It's a huge tree. And it's shady under there. I'm thinking, hmm. Are my lions there? And I start to hear rumble. And then it's quiet. And then I hear another. And it's quiet. Quiet. And I'm looking behind me at Lee and Phil, you know, who are there with the rifles. And all of a sudden, underneath that tree, that big tree in the shade, this massive bull elephant lifts his head from where he had been snoring under the tree. Yeah. And we were probably 50, 60 meters from him. And we gently walked behind some brush, you know, off to the edge of the trail. And we watched him and he watched us and he couldn't quite figure out what we were, you know? The wind was wrong for him to have caught our scent, but he knew that something was there. And we didn't wanna bother this old gentleman too much. So we decided to sort of slip out the back and around using the wind. And we cut up over the ridge next to us and then came back down into the donga ahead of where he had been laying and continued on with our lion trip. And I hope he went back to sleep. <laughs> I'm just gonna let you watch this. This is a black rhinoceros, a cow and a calf. 
It's thermal imagery. They're hot buggers. Look at how dark it is around her nostrils and on the tip of her horn, the tips of her ears. The top of her back is a little bit cooler than the rest of her body. And that's her calf following along behind her. So track and sign identification and interpretation is one aspect of trail, of tracking, sorry. Trailing is the other aspect. And trailing is what I just described to you, the following and finding of animals. And these two aspects make up the art and science of tracking. And this skill is old. It's as old as the first human-like creatures before humans walked this landscape. But there are other more modern forms of tracking or ways of interpreting animal behaviors that can co-inform the old skill. Things like thermal imagery, things like camera traps, things like VHF collars, things like GPS collars, right? All of these are forms of tracking. And while I know a bit about the old skill, what I know is constantly enriched by modern technologies and by what I can learn from the internet and from books and from teachers, you know? And I learn something new from everybody that I go track. It's great. It's a constant learning process. So note how much redder this track is than the elephant tracks that I showed you earlier. This is an iron-rich soil. And the geology in an area influences the plant life in that area. And it can also tell us what we need to be looking at, looking for on the ground as we approach an area. If we see the plant life change, and we see the soil start to change, then our momentum in our trail might slow down a little bit because we're expecting a different sight picture. We're expecting this track to change as we move. And we don't wanna to have to stop completely on the trail. So we're keeping going. Substrates, some substrates are coarse like granitic soils and quartzite hills with particular types of trees growing on the crests. This is the fresh track of a white rhinoceros moving from left to right. It has a large central forward toe and two side toes. So this is another white rhinoceros track, but it's older. It's been rained on. And track aging is probably the biggest aspect of tracking to learn. You could spend a lifetime aging tracks in particular soils. According to animals' behavior, different behaviors show up in different ways. You need an amateur meteorologist, you know, keeping track of the weather, not just precipitation events, but also wind and what direction is the wind coming from and what speed is the wind coming from. And then, okay, so we always think of weather on a macro scale, but winds that are blowing through an area that have to swirl around a clump of trees or bushes or rocks travel in a different way than if there was nothing to obstruct them. And so you get, you can find a track that you think is super fresh and you get two steps down the trail and it's gone. And then you have to figure out 
Is it gone because I don't see it and the substrate is just really difficult here? Or is this track really old? And I just thought it was fresh because it looked fresh and it was in a microcosm area where it preserved it perfect, perfectly. Here in North America, clay is like that. In England, under the yew trees, it's like that. Clay will hold a track that you will think is screaming fresh for months. <laughs> uh, so you need to think about and apply the micro and the macro to aging of tracks. And this is all ecology that we're talking about, is it not? Rhinos are big. <laughs> we have two species in South Africa. We have the black rhino that you saw in the video earlier. And then we have the right white rhino that's here. They are increasingly endangered. They were being poached for their horns, which were used in traditional medicines in Asia. And the poaching was occurring, which is the illegal hunting of an animal poaching. The poaching was occurring at a rate of one animal every eight hours or approximately three per day. And that was happening from about 2008 to 2019. And it decimated a lot of the rhino population. Their horns are made up of keratin, like our fingernails, and have been shown to contain no curative powers. But it's difficult when we were trying to honor a traditional ecological knowledge like tracking to tell other cultures that their cultural beliefs are wrong. What I can say is that the methods used to obtain the horns were and are brutal. And I wanna just give you a trigger warning about what I'm gonna say because it's the experience. And it is my lived experience to have witnessed this. So poachers often track down rhinos and they cut their spines with an ax while they're sleeping. And then they brutally hack off their horns, cutting into the bone of their skulls and leaving them to bleed to death. So they paralyze them with the ax and then they hack off the horn. And they don't use a gun or something to kill them first and humanely put them to death, you know, to kill them because a gunshot will give away their location, right? So it's very brutal. And I mentioned that this rate of poaching was going on until 2019. It seems to have slowed, but is that because the demand has decreased? or because the rhino population is Rhinos have fascinating behaviors, mesmerizing signs. This is what we call a rubbing post. It's usually not far from a place where there's water and mud and rhinos and elephants and buffaloes and warthogs all go to wallow. So all of the animals will come in and they will drink, but there are some animals that wade right in and they submerge themselves and they get right into that mud, you know, and it's cooling in the summer. And it's, you know, it's, I mean, people pay money for clay tree stuff. <laughs> so, you know, you're just going to go wade into a wallow in Africa. But then they come out of the mud and they head for these ideally positioned stumps or rocks or trees and they start rubbing up against it. And they rub the mud off and it also removes parasites, you know, because the clay starts to dry and as it dries, it, you know, it has expanded and contracted and it pulls the parasites off and then they rub them off onto these posts, right? And these rubbing posts are worn smooth in areas that are frequented by rhinos. They're polished to a high gloss that would be the envy of any carpenter. And they make you want to reach out and touch them.
And there's a creature, it's called Dermocenter rhinocerinus, which is a tick that we often, in, we often find embedded in these rubber posts. And you know, I never thought I'd be excited to see a tick coming from the Northeast of the United States, right? The birthplace of Lyme disease and stuff. But Dermacenter rhinocerinus is host specific to rhinoceros. Rhinocerinus. And on the left here is a female that have this grayish body with the two orangey spots and the stripy legs. And it's kind of pretty. And on the right, in a slightly blurry, blurry photo, because Lee, bless him, sent me these photos today from Lao, where he's working on our Saula project. So he just was sending me screenshots on his phone. So it's a little bit blurry. But can you see the little heart shapes on the back of this male, Dermacenter rhinocerinus? Yes, literally, he wears his hearts on his sleeve, right? And when you find these ticks, either out in the bush, you know, hanging on the ends of grasses, waiting for a rhinoceros to walk by, or on these rubbing posts or something, it means there are rhinoceros there. That's exciting. So rhinos are big and they poo big. <laughs> White rhinos eat grass and you can see that in the dung here, right? And that's all they eat is grass. I'm sure they eat some invertebrates in there too, so we might call them insectivores as well. But they're primar primarily. With mushrooms, all different kinds of mushrooms growing out of it. And we've seen little tiny spiders. Dang, my internet connection is too stable. So little tiny spiders using the dung balls of a rhinoceros for cover as they hide on one side of it, waiting for other invertebrates to come along that they can capture. There are many species of dung beetles, all different sizes from little tiny spider dung beetles to the big rhinoceros dung beetles, right? That use dung for their larval brood balls. And then you've got small mammals and birds that come along and they scratch around and dig around in the dung and they're looking for these invertebrates. And perhaps they're scratching around even further and they get down to the soil and they're taking a little dust bath, you know? Tracking is old. And I hope that you can see the images of animals in this rock art painting. And rock art is made with dyes and we don't know what the mixture of the dyes, we know like some of the components of how it was mixed, but not like what the actual process was. And Rock art paintings are generally somewhere between three and maybe 800 years old because it's art, it's not an etching. And they are preserved in areas where there's an overhang, you know, and so they're not preserved everywhere that they assumedly were, you know. Um, but what we find in rock art are images of animals. And If you think about the importance of tracking throughout human history, what is the importance of tracking throughout human history? To keep us safe? Imagine you walk out of your hut 
for your house, your home, whatever, your tent, even at me as a modern day researcher, if I walk out of my tent and I see this, I'm looking around. Safety. Good thing I have these little reminders to myself. Oh, just to keep you away. A lion track. And this track is a male lion. And it's taken on the reserve where we're currently working. It is a hind left. And this, you may have seen this lion, Bill. This is the Venetian man. And we call him Vinny for short. But I'm gonna pass this around so that you can touch the hind left track of a male lion and the soil. This is the sand that he walked in from Africa. Be careful with it. <laughs> <laughs> so safety, that's a big track. I mean, it was as big as my head, right? <laughs> so safety, this is a snake moving from right to left. Equally important to know, there's a lot of venomous species in Southern Africa, in many places, right? But things like scorpions and spiders, all that kind of thing that have venom that can be harmful, especially to small children. You know, if I'm living in a village of people, everybody's going to have a certain level of knowledge around how to be safe. And also for food. So safety and food are the reasons that all people everywhere had some knowledge of tracking. And in every culture, there were people like the people here in this room that have become passionate about it and spend their time doing it. And those are the people that get better and better at it, right? Those are the people that become trackers. And we like to say that in, you know, the, the, the San Bushmen who prefer to be called by their family groups, but there's a lot of family groups. So I'm not going to list them all here. But um, that, you know, they are the best trackers in the world. And that may be true about some of them. But not all of them, because not everyone will do it. The best trackers are the ones who do it. And these guys used to do it, and women. There were some women who are excellent trackers. There's actually, I think, one or two master tracker women in Botswana right now which is fascinating, but for hunting, to bring back food for people or to herd the animal as you're hunting it towards the village so you don't have to carry it as far. How clever is that? So hunting for antelope like kudu, where they use the persistence hunt method. Poison an arrow and then they run after the kudu for sometimes three hours, they pick the hottest days of the year because the kudu doesn't have sweat glands and it cannot cool itself. Chase the kudu three hours, six hours, 10 hours, whatever it takes until either they don't find the kudu or the kudu falls from exhaustion and they come along with their poison arrow and they're able to kill the animal and bring the food back for their people. But they have to maintain the same individual. Because can you imagine if you start out on one kudu and you're pushing it while you're running it, and then you get on another one, this one can rest and this one's just started. You know, that's, an, that's an incredibly complex skill to have. And I imagine that early humans did an awful lot of scavenging. This is a black backed jackal. And I think he was eating a buffalo. Um, but the presence of scavengers 
as early humans, and even up until, you know, more modern days, people who lived like the Song would have noticed when something was killed nearby, and they would have gone and they would have chased off the lions and said, okay, I'm going to take this leg and, you know, that rump and that tenderloin, and maybe they didn't call it that, but that's food for us. And then the lions can come back and eat what's left. But they had to know how to find the carcasses. And that's where learning about the different bird behaviors came in. So this is a batelier, which is a type of eagle. And batelier fly relatively low in the sky, along with tawny eagles. And when you see them, especially in conjunction with tawny eagles, it's an indication that there's probably a kill nearby because they fly low enough and they have that really good eyesight that they're the first ones to pick up on, maybe there's something dead over there. And then the vultures see the tawnies and the bateliers coming in and the vultures fly high up in that wheel in the sky, just soaring on the breezes. And the vultures see the tawnies and the bateliers flying down. And they come in and you get the hooded vultures and the white bat vultures. And the hooded vultures have these sharp little pointed beaks that are designed for picking in between the ribs. And you get the lappet face vulture, which is the, which is the biggest vulture that we have down there. And it has a monstrous beak. They call it the can opener. Because when a carcass hasn't been opened by a lion or a hyena or a leopard or something, the other birds have to wait until it's opened to get in. Because some of those carcasses are tough. You know, think of the hide of an elephant, right? So the lappet face comes down and he's the can opener, or she. And then the other vultures start coming in and the hooded gets in between the ribs. And the um, things like the white back are sort of a medium sized vulture and they're generalists, right? And so, recognizing what we call the soaring dynamics of those birds today helps us to locate kills as guides in Africa. And I'm certain that trackers were doing that throughout history. So some of you have heard this story about cyber tracker. The way that the system of evaluation that we belong to began was Louis Liebenberg, who developed the system, was invited to a very prestigious lodge by the owner and by the head guide. And they said, we believe we have the best trackers in South Africa and we would like for you to come evaluate them. And they had heard of him because he had just published his first tracking book, which is still considered like the guide in Africa because the tracks are so accurate. They're drawn so well. And he used composite drawings that he sat out in the field and he drew 100 Fisher, not Fisher, civet tracks, you know, and then created the perfect civet track as an example. And he did that with all of the species in the book. And so his book had come out and he was sort of known as like the guy, right? So let's get the guy to come and evaluate our trackers, right? And Louis showed up and he didn't exactly know how he was going to evaluate the trackers. Didn't, didn't know, he'd never done this before. You know, it was, okay, I'll just figure it out as I go. And uh, so the morning arrives, he heads out into the driveway with the guides and the trackers and the head guide is there and the head tracker, who is a man named Wilson Messia. And Wilson Messia was legendary in that area where the, the tribal group is mostly known as the Shangan people. And Wilson was a Shangan man. And during the apartheid era, he 
had gained renown as somebody who would escort people across hundreds of kilometers of the Kruger Park from Mozambique to South Africa or from South Africa to Mozambique. And this was at the time where you heard stories every day of man-eating lions. And you know, to cross a hundred kilometers or more, you've got to be there overnight if you're on foot, right? And he was renowned for keeping people safe and escorting them. And the way that he, one of the ways that he did that is through using tracking, through recognizing the tracks and signs of the animals and when they were fresh and when they were not and when they were dangerous and when they were not, as he crossed with these people, these ecosystems. So Wilson's standing. And Louis walks out into the driveway and he circles a track, this track. And it was probably one of these tracks, not even the whole sequence. I'm not sure, but for some reason that just seems like that would be it in my mind. I'll have to ask Louis. <laughs> but he circles this track. Actually, it wasn't this track. I'm misspeaking. It was a different track. But he circles a track in the driveway. And he says, okay, I want you guys to come and tell me what this track is. And they kind of just stand there and look at them. And they look around. And they're just like, who are you to tell me what to do? And I can imagine the thought process, right? I've been working as a tracker, finding animals for people every day in the ecotourism industry for five, 10, 15, 20, sometimes 30 years. And you are going to come in here and test me. There was a little bit of resistance to that idea. <laughs> and so they just stood there and Louis didn't quite know what to do. And Wilson stepped forward. And Wilson circled this track. Sorry, I misspoke before. So Wilson circled this track. And he called all of the trackers through, one by one. Did you tell me what that track is? And all of the trackers went and they kind of, they, they do this because they're proud of who they are and what they do and they do it well, right? So they just walk and they look down at the track because you don't, if you're a tracker, you know your stuff, right? And you don't need to get down there and look at the track. You just keep going, you know, you just walk by and you look at the track and they walked up to Wilson and they whispered in his ear and they said, Impala or Diker or Steenbok or any number of the small antelope with little pointed feet that were in that area. And Wilson lets them all go by. And he says to Louie, now you, Mr. Evaluator. <laughs> he probably didn't say that, but <laughs> he said, you tell me what that track is. And so Louie goes up to the track and he doesn't quite get down on all fours, but he stops and he looks and he moves around the track. You know, because perspective is everything. You know, your perspective is different from my perspective, is different from yours, is different from yours. And every angle gives you new information with everything. That's a huge statement, right? But he looks at the track, he stops to look at the track and takes his time with the answer. And then he goes up to Wilson. This is in 1994 or something like that. He goes up to Wilson. And he says, scrub hair. And you can see here the bounding tracks from left to right, front, front, and two more or less paired but slightly offset hind tracks of a bounding scrub hair. And many people get this track wrong the first time that they see it, or the second, or the third time, <laughs> because it really does resemble a small antelope if you're new to it or if you're not looking closely. 
And these were people that, yes, they follow and find animals for ecotourism every day, but they're looking for leopards and lions and rhinoceros and elephants and buffaloes and hippos and giraffes and, you know, like the big charismatic megafauna that people want to see all the time. They're not looking for the hair hurts. <laughs> Unless it's as an aspect of aging. You know, when do scrub hairs move at night? If the scrub hair is on top of your tracks, that tells you something, you know? So that's how the system of track and sign for evaluating with CyberTracker began. And Louis and Wilson co-developed the system together. And it has changed many times over the years. I can think of different ways that even in 2006, when I took my first evaluation, the way that it was run and the things that I had heard of how it was run in Africa before that. And as trackers, every time we go to an evaluation, we kind of go, mm, it wasn't like that last time. <laughs> because we want everything to be like familiar <laughs> when we go, you know, like we want the process to be transparent and familiar. But guess what? The process is always evolving. And that's a good thing, right? As we find out better ways to do things, it should evolve. And as we find out more information, it should evolve, right? So these are good things. And what we see, this little graph here, your knowledge in the field as that increases on the bottom scale, and on the left, going from low to high, your confidence increases. See you right, right? But what we see with tracking is that when your knowledge and your confidence are both low, you're kind of like, I know some of these things, but not a lot about it. And then as your confidence increases, but maybe not your, like you start to learn a couple things, right? And you're like, oh, I can recognize that now. But you haven't really spent a lot of time in the field yet, right? And then you go through this dip as you continue continue to gain experience and knowledge in the field where somewhere in there, you know, you're level three, these are the levels of the cyber tracker process, right? So level one starts at a 70, level two starts at an 80, level three starts at a 90. And then when you get all the way out here to where you finally know a little bit and your confidence is okay, then you pass mostly. And you've achieved 100%, but you know that like, you will never see that statement that says, I know everything. When you reach that professional stage, it truly is, trust me, it's complicated, right? Because you can never know everything. Like the best teacher in the world cannot teach you everything. You cannot teach yourself everything because the book of nature has no beginning. It has no end, right? We can never know it all. But what we can do is we can give you a process for learning or multiple processes for learning. And you stick with the one that works good for you for three years and then you modify the process a little bit and you know you keep learning and hopefully you start teaching because that's the best way. And then once you achieve 100% and you're at professional, there's a whole nother evaluation. It's more difficult. <laughs> And if you pass that one, which according to my research takes about a decade to get to um, track and sign specialist and trailing specialist. So, but you know, it took people like me a decade. And before that, you know, people a decade, the average was a decade. But I firmly believe that with all of the resources that people have at their fingertips now, that this could be achievable in half that time, some people. And then if you go through not just the track and sign, but the trailing aspect of the tracker evaluations, you can become a tracker, 
Remember we said tracking is track and sign identification and interpretation and trailing. There's two aspects. They're fundamentally fine. And when you are tracking, you are doing both of them. When you are a tracker, you are doing both of them. And then when you become a specialist in both, you're a senior tracker. And master tracker on this system is an honorary designation where you have been a senior tracker, so specialist in both track and sign and trailing for at least 10 years and have contributed significantly to the field of tracking, whether that's through evaluating so many thousands of participants or writing books or doing research or you just are so darn good in your teaching that you know you are an amazing tracker and you're doing amazing things for teaching or for conservation or but you really have to contribute something and you have to be willing to be one of the people that is out there passing on the knowledge what good is a lifetime of learning if you hold it here you know knowledge is for giving away so after the track and sign evaluation was developed with Wilson, or initially at least. Um, Louis was continuing a relationship working with the Sun in the Kalahari, and they had been continually pushed onto lands where they were being marginalized. You know, I mean, it's a story that we hear from many places. And they were struggling to feed their families and themselves. And they had become friends with Louis. And at one point they turned to him and they said, Louis, do you think you could get us jobs? And he thought about that for a while. And he partnered with somebody who wrote software and they wrote a piece of software and they called it CyberTracker. The system of evaluation had already been develop developed but they called this cyber tracker, the marriage of technology, modern and old, right? And at first it ran on a, what was called a Palm Pilot back then, I remember those. And they had little GPS, you know, that you would put in the top, or you could do the backpack thing, you know, with a much more accurate GPS sticking out of your backpack, right? But they could, so or illiterate people, people who um, don't read and write, but are very intelligent nonetheless, they could look at, it's icon driven, they could look at the little picture of a kudu and they could push the kudu. And they could push it three times if there was three kudu. And then they could push the track or they could push the scat or they could push the animal or, you know, like they could record data using their skill they were able to use their traditional skills, what they were good at, to collect data for the national parks there, which is an ideal circumstance, right? And Louis started to notice there were errors in the data. And he developed this system with a man called Nate very difficult for me to do the click language. So I apologize for probably pronouncing that very incorrectly. I mean, no disrespect. But Nate, Nate and Louis, this is Nate in the CyberTracker logo. And as a good friend of mine, Daniel Hanchi says, this logo is a person. It's not just a logo. It's not just you know, a brand or a badge or a sticker or whatever. This is a person who helped develop this system. And these people were able to take pride in their skill. And they often refer to themselves as like, this is my cyber track up here. You know, it's no longer the piece that runs in a cell phone now and is free because Louis gives away everything for free because he just believes in the power of tracking to help the world. And 
So there's this whole other side, you know, there's these two different sides. There's a technology in the software, and then there's the tracker evaluation system in CyberTrack. And what's in a name? Cyber Tracker. Just like original wisdom is the marriage of old and new, Cyber Tracker is the marriage of old and new. But where did that name come from? In conversation with Louis, he told me that in Greek, the very, very early days of sailing ships, that in Greek, the pilot of a ship or a navigator, the person who adjusted the sails, who paid attention to the weather and what sea creatures or birds were present and how the waves were running and the colors of the water and pulled in all of this information. The pilot of the ship was called the cyber. And he adjusted the sails according to the information that he constantly was getting on the water to maintain the course. And so that, those adjustments were based upon those feedback loops coming out of the environment and processing them through his brain and making a decision and constantly revising that decision. Does that sound like science? And then it's also based on the field of cybernetics, which guess what? Is based on feedback loops. So the sensor, the controller, the other system feeding back. And tracking is a system, a process that is based on feedback loops. If you walk up to a track, you process that information. Hopefully you take some time doing it. You process that information, you come to a decision, and then you get feedback either from the track itself or from an evaluator or from your peers as to why that track is or is not what you thought it was. And if it's not what you thought it was, you revise your thinking in a feedback loop. If you're on a trail and you're following an animal and all of a sudden another animal crosses it and maybe you get off the trail and you stop and you say, wait a minute, that doesn't look quite the same. You're processing, you're constantly processing information and revising your response to the environment based on those feedback loops. So this is where the name comes from. And it's used to evaluate guides in Africa and trackers in Africa for the ecotourism industry and also to train anti-poachers. This picture was taken when Lee and I were up in the Congo in early 2021, when we were training the first guides to be back in Garamba National Park in over a decade. And on the left, you see part of their military force representing the tracking, the trackers, the anti-poaching force in Garamba and in Africa. And on the right, you see somebody who's training to be a guide, right? So there's these different facets of it. Remember, we talked about the importance of the tracking for anti-poaching. Made up of heritage. More and more, we're seeing people in Africa and in other countries as well, that they're not just using it as an occupation, although many are, or as an aspect of an occupation, but they're also using it because it's darn fascinating. More and more people are using it for other things, including aspects of employment, you know, as one aspect of a guiding job or a teaching job, or um, even as a hobby. You know, more and more people are learning about it as a hobby that connects them to the natural world. Because as I hope you have seen, the tracking is ecology. You know, by learning about tracking, you're learning about all of the different facets of ecology, from big to very, very small, 
to from the soils to the plants to everything that's out there. And it's a fascinating journey. It includes people. And this was an area of our old reserve that many people would have called ugly. But I loved to go here because it was an area that was kept open because they needed the power line infrastructure. Let's face it, we need power at this point. We need fossil fuels, unfortunately. We're working towards becoming more independent of that. But like right now, we need that. And when you think of Africa, a lot of times, you wanna think of the big charismatic animals and vast open spaces and you know, like the wilderness factor, we call it. But there are very few places on earth that you can go where people are not and that you don't see signs of people. And people can be an integral part to support nature, right? And these power lines, while they might be ugly in and of themselves, they keep this area open for animals that require open habitat, right? And they provide, I don't know if you can see it, but there's lots of little nests up in the top of the power line you know, for different birds. And the baboons, they come and they climb these metal towers at night and they sit in them because a leopard can't get up there. <laughs> you know? And I just put this slide in here because we can't forget that people are a part of nature, right? And we like to sometimes put nature in a box and say that's over there and people are just mucking it up, right? But there are a lot of people that are doing a lot of really good things for nature too. And we're not separate from nature. We are nature. And I want to close this presentation now because it's been over an hour and just say thank you for everyone for listening. Well, thank you, Dr. Lawrence. This was wonderful, wonderful.